in the Lewis structure video that you just looked at, the structures that we drew are all structures that follow the octet rule. It turns out that some other compounds can be formed even though they violate the octet rule. And there's different types of violations that are possible, so I'm going to describe them here. The most common one is what we call the expanded octet or hypervalency. These are elements that can have more than eight electrons in their valence shell. And the reason for this is because because once you are in the third row in the periodic table, all these elements in theory have 3d orbitals. If you're in row 4, you're going to have 4d orbitals and 4f orbitals, which means that those orbitals are available to accommodate additional electrons beyond the 8 that are allowed by the s and the p orbitals for that specific shell. And as a result, you start seeing violations of the elements. For example, sulfur can actually have compounds that have 10 electrons or even 12 electrons depending on what it's paired up with because it has that additional 3d orbitals that are available to host additional electrons. A less common violation is having fewer than 8 electrons which we call electron deficient species. In this case it would be first and second row elements that have fewer electrons. So the main one of course is hydrogen. It only needs two electrons. I don't really see it as a violation because the closest number noble gas to hydrogen is helium, which only has two electrons. So to me, that's still an element that follows the octet rule, except that the closest noble gas happens to have only two. But I know in certain textbooks, this is highlighted as a violation. Now, the more clear-cut violation are beryllium and boron. So beryllium can actually form compounds that only have four electrons around it, and boron can form compounds that have six electrons around them. And both of these compounds have been found to be stable enough to exist. If you put them with some something else that can give them more electrons, they will actually form species that form an octet shell, but they could also form those electron deficient shell. So that's just something to keep in mind and to memorize. And then of course we have species that form even though they have odd electron numbers. So for example, NO, if you calculate the number of valence electron is 11, which means that we can't even draw a Lewis structure that would represent NO, but that species exists naturally. And so as you'll see, this is one of the deficiencies associated with the Lewis model, which we will correct later on by developing the molecular orbital model for representing molecules. So let's take a look at an example of how to draw Lewis structures for compounds that violate the octet rule. We're going to start with XEF2 here, and just like any Lewis structure, we would begin with looking at the valence electrons. Xenon is 8, and then fluorine is 7, and there's two of them. So it adds up to be 22. My skeletal structure is just going to be xenon single bonded to F. And the way I do this is I always put the terminal atoms to be octet first, because the violation of octet occurs in the central atom, not in the terminal atom. Now, fluorine happens to be on the second row of the periodic table, right? So that also means that it cannot violate the octet rule. So then it's doubly important that you make sure that the fluorine is octet in this case. So once I put the octet on the fluorine, I count how many electrons I have used. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If I use 8, that means I have 16 electrons. So I subtract 16 from 22, my original number, and I have 6 electrons left. And those 6 electrons have to go to the central atom. And then so before I do that, I always want to ask myself if the central atom can violate the octet rule or not. Now, xenon is an element that exists exists on the fifth period in the periodic table. So it's definitely something that has those additional empty orbitals. So as a result, xenon is something that could violate the octet rule. So I would add all those six electrons into xenon. As you see here, I drew it with red colors to differentiate that last three pairs of electrons, just to make sure that you know that that's the six that's left. If you count the number of electrons around xenon, you end up getting 10 electrons. And so you want to always be careful when you do that that xenon is something that can violate the octet rule and we had established that it could. So then that would be the final correct structure for XEF2. So I'm going to repeat that with the other two species. BrCl3, again, going through the valence electron calculation, gives me 28 electrons. Now the skeletal structure is going to be Br single bonded to 3Cl. And again, starting with the terminal atoms being octet, results in 24 electrons being used for that purpose. So four 
is left. That last four has to go to the central atom. So same question is asked, is bromine an element that can violate the octet rule? And bromine is also on the fifth period. So therefore, it's fine to do the drawing that way where bromine has 10 electrons. So we'll go to the next one now, BF3. Valence calculation shows you have 24 electron. And the skeletal structure would be just boron bonded to the three fluorines. Again, establishing octet for all the terminal atoms, all the fluorines, and ended up using all the electrons that we have. So zero electrons are left. So now your boron only has six electrons. Now, sometimes there's a tendency at this point for students to think, oh, maybe I have to make a double bond here between one of the fluorines with the boron just so that everybody has octet. But you have to remember that boron is a species that can have fewer than eight electrons. So it's an electron deficient species. It's allowed. And so that would be the correct structure. So you actually don't want to draw this because that would be wrong in this case. There's an issue with the formal charge, which we'll discuss in the next video.